You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. We're here live in London launching two books. We just had a conversation about my book, uh, Pricing Creativity, A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour. And now we're going to talk about your latest book, The Business of Expertise, How Entrepreneurial Experts Convert Insight into Impact and Wealth. Now, in full disclosure to this audience, we've already done two podcasts on the topic of this book. So I think we'll probably talk for 10 or 15 minutes. I'll ask you the few remaining questions. And uh, there's a couple I want to go over again, too. Yeah. Yeah. And you grin as you say that. I'm a little nervous. (laughs) And then we'll throw it open to the floor because this is a broad book that covers lots of interesting topics, and I think there's going to be a lot of questions about it. Let me first ask, what was the impetus for the book? Why this book now? It started out as a, a completely different book, honestly. And so that, that was the impetus was for that book. I was thinking, I want to write a big manual, like a reference manual for expertise. And so I had this massive outline and even I was getting dopey tired thinking about it and writing it. And so the idea for this book didn't actually come about until I was writing it. And I discovered that I felt so much more passionate about portions of the book. And so I left out big sections of the outline and decided to write something that was more from my heart rather than something that looked like my previous books were, which looked a lot like sort of Wikipedia books, you know, they were just full of reference information. And this, this was something that just really inspired me. I I think most of all, I want people who read this to feel more committed to courageously pursuing a very specific expertise, whatever it is. I don't care what, what, what the expertise is. I'm tired on the one hand, I'm tired of people making shit up all the time. And if you've tasted both expertise and incompetence, if you've tasted both of those in your professional life, and I have, for Should we ask for a show of hands? And all of you, including us, we've all tasted incompetence. Some of you have tasted expertise as well. And the, the staggering difference between those two changes your life. Like we all define expertise a little bit differently. The way I define it is speaking to a crowd of four to 5,000 people, live TV cameras, and this has happened, and there's time for questions, and I'm not nervous at all about any question anybody could ask. That's to me, is how I would define the comfort that comes in really knowing what you're talking about with something. So that's, that's was, that was a motivation for the book. So is this primarily a book on positioning for creative firms? It ended up being that way, yeah, because yeah. I don't understand how you could be competent without – the world is too big. You just simply can't understand the whole thing. You have to pick a portion of it in your professional life, and that, that's what positioning is, is deciding where you're going to be competent, right? And then with the other parts of the world that you exclude in your positioning decision, you can play around in those areas and just not charge clients for it. That's, that's what you do on your own time. But I don't understand how you could be competent without a positioning decision. Yeah, and I, I think you and I have had this conversation before. I'm reminded of, um, he might even be in the audience. There's a, f- a firm here in the UK that you and I have both worked with, and he, the uh, principal has seen both of us speak. So we, we used to do an event in Nashville once a year, every 10 years, called the New Business Summer. So he came over and participated in that event, and then he's seen us both speak on the subject of positioning in the UK. And what he said is, I could not believe the difference in reaction from the audience. In North America, you're talking about the need to specialize and focus, and everybody's in agreement. And in the UK, half the audience is fighting you on that point. And you talk about tasting expertise. When you're seen as the expert in a kind of a narrow, deep area, you wouldn't dream of going back to this place of being the generalist, would you? And that's what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it changes everything. Like you feel like there's a certain confidence that comes that feeds your pricing, which ties into your new book about pricing creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it ended up being a book about positioning. You looped in or somehow conned two fairly famous people to get involved and participate in this book. First of all, you've got a great blurb from Dan Pink. Um, is there a story there? Well, I had invited Dan. I knew Dan. I invited him to speak at a conference I was doing down in Mexico, and he came and keynoted the conference. And so I'd stayed in touch with him a little bit and just sent him a note asking if he would 
be willing to endorse the book. And I'd asked several people, and he was willing. How many of you have read a book that Dan Pink has written? Quite a few of you. It's just, you know, he's a remarkable writer. He's one of those writers that anything you write, I'm going to buy a copy of it. So I was very, very touched that he was willing to do that. Yeah. And I noticed you've got his blurb on the front of the book and mine on the back of the book. So yeah. obviously that was a publishing And error. it's actually only on that copy. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> And the second person who's involved in this project, unbeknownst to him in the beginning, is Derek Sivers. Now, I want to read this forward. Okay. Do you mind? Yeah. So it says, forward with an asterisk. And it's a note from Derek Sivers. Hi, hi, David. So sorry I have to say no to writing the forward. But please don't take it personally, because I'm saying no to absolutely everything. I'm years behind in my own project, so I've vowed to add nothing new to my life until my already started things are finished. If you're interested in some more thoughts on this, search for my article on saying no to everything else. Also, I'm not an entrepreneur anymore, so don't feel qualified to say anything about it. As I wrote recently, you have to keep earning your title or it expires, and it's been years since I started a company. I'm honored that you asked, though, and I wish you the best. Let's stay in touch. Derek Sivers. Is there a story there, David? Well, <laughs> yeah, I got it. My first reaction was like, oh, shoot. Like, I really wanted Derek to write the foreword. And um, then I started thinking about it. It's like, Derek, how long did you spend telling me you weren't going to write the forward? <laughs> like, why didn't you just write the forward? That would have been quicker than giving me this long explanation. So I just wrote him back and I just said, Derek, can I just make that? You really appreciated the, the, um, the yeah. honesty and the directness. Yeah, two things. Like, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneurial expert anymore. And that's what the book is about because he, he felt like his entrepreneurial expertise card had expired because he hadn't started something within a certain period of time. I admired that. I, I'm not sure I'm that courageous. I, but, and then the other thing was just saying, no, I'm, I am, I'm focusing. This, this is the guy that used to take questions from people from anywhere and answer their questions for not for free. And it got to the point where he just wasn't getting his own projects done. And I just think that there's such a lesson in there, right? There's very little connection between intelligence and success. Thank goodness, Blair. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't mean it the way you read that. I meant it another way, okay. but, but you took it that way, yeah. <laughs> where there is a strong connection between success and something else, it's really discipline. And give me somebody who is disciplined – Regardless of how qualified they are, regardless of how courageous they are, these are the people that are just working away. They're not winning all the awards. They're not the famous people. They're not speaking at all of the events that you have, but they're just doing solid work, and they're sending out their emails with brilliant content to their their prospects, and they pay attention to the financial performance of their firm, and they manage people well. Those are the people that I admire, not necessarily the famous ones. And, and so the idea that, that we can you know, be disciplined and say no to things ties in so well to positioning, right? Blair, you've taught me so much about that, about positioning, about how positioning is primarily saying no. It's what you say no to. It's, a, it's an exercise in exclusion more than anything. You're not drawing a circle around as many things that you've done as possible, right? It's about what are you going to say no to? Warren Buffett has this great quote. Um, the difference between successful people and really successful people is really successful people say no to almost everything. Yeah. So I think that forward of, of Derek's really embody that. And I, I don't know much about him, but it sounds like he's a little bit scarred from saying yes to too many yeah. things. And he realized one day he woke up and realized oh, me saying yes to everything has derailed all of the projects that I want to do. Right. Yeah. Right. And then so he graciously allowed you yeah, to Yeah, he was print willing that. to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get to questions soon, but there's a couple of things. And one in the previous podcast where we've talked about your book, I don't think we've ever gone into this deep enough. Your first chapter, the role of expertise in a developed society. Maybe this is a bit of a tangent I want to go on. When Adam introduced you earlier, he said you had this great, your first line of your bio, I think it is, is David grew up with the tribe of Mayan Indians. We've had conversations about this. You are really shaped as a person and your business is shaped by how you grew up, and you have a lot of experience. You talk about in a developed society versus an undeveloped society. Do you want to, maybe you want to just do a couple of minutes on your upbringing, and then talk about the difference between how expertise is viewed and communicated in a developed society versus an undeveloped society, because it's, it's remarkable how mm -hmm. different it is. Yeah. 
So my parents were medical missionaries. So from when I was four, we moved to this town in the highlands of Guatemala. No electricity, no plumbing, no roads to speak of, no stores to speak of, and lived there for 13 years I did. So I didn't come to the U.S. really till I was 18. And so it was a very different upbringing. I didn't know that it was all that different at the time until I came to the U.S. And I don't regret any of that upbringing. I don't feel like I missed anything, honestly. I, But it gave me a chance in all of my thinking to compare expertise in a developed world versus an undeveloped world. And I go back there every year just to connect with the people there and and not much has changed. And one of the things that's really different is that in a in a developed world like the society we live in here, experts are inaccessible. And when experts have to mix with the unwashed masses, the rest of us, they either have guards or they're in special cars or they wear uniforms to set them apart like pilots at an airport or or maybe someone in the service or a police officer or something like that. And we we confuse this a lot because we think that we are in the service business and so we try to be as accessible as possible to our clients, not understanding that we can be too accessible and we can lose some of that notion of expertise. Some people in our firms need to be very accessible, but the folks who have the more expert practitioner role – don't need to be that accessible. As opposed to in an undeveloped culture, the experts are the people who are the most accessible people. That's the village elder. It was always a male back then. The village elder who was sitting in the middle of the of the marketplace and could be approached by anybody that they wanted to. So it's sort of an interesting perspective between the two. There's this idea called the scarcity heuristic that if you're readily available, you can't be all that valuable. And that's what's being applied in the developed world. And i I notice in in our business as we move from a consulting practice to a training company and I became more and more removed from the clients, I, my status in their eyes seemed to go up. So it just prompted me to be kind of remove myself even further. Um, so it's interesting. I've seen that play out yeah. in my own business. You bounce in and out of that relationship and they listen in a different way than they would have if you were the day-to-day person. Yeah. Somebody fills out a form on our website. They're interested in training. And if I pick up the phone and or somebody sets up a call um, and it's me on the call, they're really quite surprised and, and honored. And I'm really flattered that they're honored. And I think, well, that's just because I'm just, um, I'm otherwise unavailable. Right. You know, if I were like Derek Sivers used to be out there answering all these emails, that would be different. Before we get to the questions, you write in the book, you've got a chapter on connecting expertise to personal fulfillment. Hmm. And the idea, you talk a little bit about how I think you're essentially making the case that experts are more happy in their personal lives. Is that the case? If we think of an expert is having a very, very deep expertise, a narrow but very, very deep expertise. What keeps their expertise relevant? Like how do they not become somebody who knows something completely but isn't aware of what else is happening in the world, which is a, a very significant danger? And what I think we should be doing with that dilemma is to be really narrow, deep experts at work, but we should have personal lives that are really interesting, so interesting that – We get mad when our work lives impinge on our ability to have our personal lives, right? But the way creatives historically have approached this is that they have melded the two together. And in doing so, that is the personal and the business lives. But in doing so, they have brought the expectations they've had from their personal lives into their work life. And that's impacted their positioning. So while it might make sense to have a narrow positioning from a business argument standpoint, it sounds boring to them. And because most of what they get from life comes from the business, they are reticent to make a decision that will harm their overall life. So there's something else going on as well. And that's the idea of getting bored with expertise just kind of floors me, honestly, because I I find expertise really fascinating. Um, but I also find the rest of life very, very fascinating. And so I want to I get my job done in a limited number of hours, and I want to make so much money in my job that I can fund these other hobbies that I have and keeping these two lives as separate as possible. I remember one of the first times I heard you speak, you were doing the closing keynote at a conference for owners of design firms. 
And you were admonishing the audience from the podium. I really admired and went out of my way to copy that style <laughs> uh, from that day. And you were, you were talking about this topic of this blending of the personal life and the professional life. And you said, you pointed at the audience and said, some of you don't even have friends who aren't clients. And in that moment, I thought, oh, I immediately thought of some of my own clients, owners of creative businesses who had blended their personal lives and their professional lives so deeply that everything that they did, even recreationally, personally, was somehow tied to business. I never didn't recognize that pattern before. And I've seen it a lot since. I think we, maybe we see it a little bit less now, yeah. hopefully. I think our industry as a whole has, has matured. And people come to this field nowadays with different expectations. It's not a sentence for life like it used to be. Yeah. And they have other interests that are very important to them, which I think is really healthy. You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship. Your hosts are David C. Baker of Recourses, author, speaker, and advisor to owners of expert firms, and Blair Enns of Win Without Pitching, the sales training and coaching program for creative entrepreneurs. For more information, go to twobobs.com. If you find this podcast helpful, please help us by telling a friend and rating us on iTunes. Thank you. Now back to David and Blair. All right. This has been great. I've, so I've asked you some questions and I think we'll hand it over to Adam who will take the microphone out into the audience and see if you have any questions for David. Lob some easy softballs this way. Just while people are thinking then, I've got a couple that I've been thinking of. What are the prime reasons why a creative-led agency, led by a creative entrepreneur, why do they not pursue expertise? What stops them? One thing that stops them is that they're afraid that it's going to be boring. That's, that's part of it, right? Another comes when they want to democratize the positioning decision, and they personally wouldn't have a problem with a narrowed focus, but they're not sure how their employee base will feel about it. And that employee base, on average, is about 12 to 15 years younger, and that gap stays the same as the firm ages. So as the employee base um, gets older, they begin chasing um, variety less and expertise more, but that, that's one of those issues for sure. And how we answer that question is different in different countries. You know, I, I admire the entrepreneurial pursuit that you folks in the UK have because I think it's much I, – I not think. I know it's much more difficult to be successful here than, the, than it is in the U.S. In the U.S., the work is just falling off the trucks. I mean if you, if you are not successful in the U.S., then you are either new to the game and it hasn't – you know, you haven't got the stride yet. You haven't, right, got there. Um, or you've just had some really bad luck or you're just incompetent. I mean, in here, you, it just not, um, it, it's just not that easy. And so there's, there's less business to chase here. There are fewer competitors. Your positioning is not going to be quite as pure as it would be unless you're more of a global firm. So we can't answer the question exactly the same in every country, but, but the fears are the same everywhere. So everyone's on Skyscanner now booking their flights to the States. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose the, the, the main premise around your book is that expertise renders your work less interchangeable. Right. So if you are the expert, clients come to you. Right. And it's built around this notion of distributed control. It's a phrase that I began using a few years ago. And very simply put, it's this, that in the best business relationships, there are two parties and each party has some control. The control that the client has is pretty obvious. They can like delay payment. They can fight you on the price. They can not make themselves available, not give you what you need. And ultimately, they can just fire you. They, they, they exercise their control in passive aggressive ways and very overt ways all the time. What control do you have in that relationship? Because unless you have some control in that relationship, it's not a balanced business relationship. And your control, though, as the provider of expertise is just a single thing, and that's to withhold your expertise. Now, you don't 
have to do that. Seldom would you actually have to withhold your expertise, but you have to be willing to do it. And and imagining withholding your expertise is what helps you make some of those better positioning and pricing decisions. So if you decide to withhold your expertise, then the clock starts, and that's how long the prospect or the client has to find what they deem to be a suitable substitute for your services. And the problem here is that the client gets to decide who is a suitable substitute. You may hear of who they hire and scoff and say, oh, my God, they'll never do work that's as good as we would do and so on. It doesn't matter. What matters is the client gets to decide who's a suitable substitute for you. So however long that stopwatch runs until they find a suitable substitute, that measures how much power you have in the relationship, right? So if there are a lot of substitutes that your clients think are suitable, then you don't have much power in their relationship. That's, that's the whole concept, very simply put. Uh, David, thank you for that. Um, Deborah from the DBA. Um, I have a particular bugbear about our industry, uh, which is that we tend to acquiesce to the demands of clients uh, very quickly. And so um, you'll have a meeting uh, which has been in the diary for weeks and it gets cancelled maybe a couple of hours before because a client has uh, phoned the agency you're meeting with and uh, and they have to, to sort out the, the issue there. Um, how and when is it okay to say no to clients? So you spoke about the expert, the distancing of that person. How do we get on top of kind of this dirty little habit that we have of just saying yes to clients, whatever, whenever, and it keeps us at work till midnight? Yeah, right. Such a great question. I, I wrote this article one time saying that prostitutes were better at running their businesses than design firms because, you know, there's no scope creep. <laughs> Because the all the fees are paid in advance, and anyway, I don't remember what the third one was. Full service really means full, full service. service. Uh, really means full service. <laughs> Here, Blair remembers, uh, and that gets to the heart of it. Really, uh, something that I've thought a lot about. Actually, Blair introduced this thought to me: is when if a client is not going to be a good fit, and you've just described a client that's not a good fit, when do you want to find out? Do you want to find out? And before it was always in my mind, it was like, oh, I don't want to find out now because I'm, I have hope. Like I have hope that this is going to turn into something. I Surely I can – I mean look at how successful wives turn men into great husbands. That's a joke. They don't, right? <laughs> like I've got hope that this is going to turn into a great relationship. But if it's not going to be a great relationship, I want to find out right now. So like in my practice, it's like – I ask them to initiate the call to me, and it's usually not at a normal time. All the fees are prepaid. There are no references. It's like I'm, it's like I'm in control. This is, I'm the expert. If you want help, you're going to play by my rules. And I'm very eager to help you, and once you hire me, you're going to have my full attention. But until then, you're just somebody who might hire me, and I don't care all that much. That's the kind of perspective we've got to have. But we're so desperate for this opportunity to – slave away for something with a client that we we bend over backwards and we're doing all the things that don't position us as an expert. Thanks, David. Um, I'm Aria from Make It Clear. I wanted to ask you if the implication of what you're saying uh, is that if agencies or firms are going to increasingly have a specific expertise, a specific positioning, that there's going to have to be more collaboration perhaps between firms between from expert to expert mm. um, rather than trying to capture as much budget or capture as much of the brief as possible being comfortable to say i'm an expert in this specific stage for example and i have a partner here who's an expert in the following stage and us together are going to be able to achieve the solution or achieve the the value that you're looking for? That's such a great question. You know, and I think the the lack of precise positioning is what makes so many of the other firms in our geographic area competitors to us when they shouldn't be competitors. If we're really positioned well, we have very few competitors. And we're also so much more honest about what we're good at. And we're we also are so confident that the right work will come to us consistently that we're not terrified about 
instead of turning a client into possibly a good client, we, we say, no, listen, you're not well served by me in this area. This would be, and we could be a lot more collaborative, right? I've often wondered why we don't have more transparency with each other because the answers to the problems that we're facing are here in this room. We're just not talking about them. We're not sharing them with each other because we care too much that we think it's a zero-sum game and my success is going to hurt you. My own perspective in my business has been to be very open with my competitors, and I have very good relationship with almost all of them. And I feel like there's so much business for all of us, and we can – I understand what I'm really good at, and I understand where my weaknesses are and where somebody else is going to be a good fit. That's a really good question. Another question from me. Um, when – does a conflict of interest become a specialism? Where's, what's the, the, where's the point where you become an expert? Yeah. So, and that's one thing that makes firms nervous about vertical positioning is the conflict of interest issue because they have multiple clients who all view the other clients on that roster as a potential conflict. And I think that's it's really sort of lazy thinking to include too much conflict of interest excuses in our positioning. I uh, clients do fear conflict of interest sometimes. It depends on the industry, but what they fear even more is incompetence. And the the only way to be competent is to have clients who could be competitors. And so you'll find that most firms, after they've had several of them, then they kind of get over that. I think the glib answer is it's between two and three. And the saying is, and maybe it's, I stole this from you, but two two clients in the same space is a conflict and three is a specialism. All right. Last hey. question. Hi, David. It's Miles from Invica. Better make it a good question. What's some of the um, more unique, interesting, good, weird, bad positioning statements that you've seen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're yeah. going to give away our future book. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, we're, both of us are keeping a log, and when it doesn't matter, when we start spilling all the secrets, then we're going to write it. I really the the oddest ones, the ones that make me just kind of scratch my head, are the ones that aren't a positioning statement at all. I, I wrote something about it in the blog post. I was in Oxford yesterday, and I, that's when I wrote it. Where I wrote it, and it was uh, the the name of the blog post was "More Better Is Not a Strategy." So the, the idea is that. We all do the same things, but I do them better. Like you say you listen to clients, but I really listen to clients. You say that your work is integrated, but ours is really integrated. We don't have all these layers. We – right here, you work directly with the people doing the work. We don't we don't mess with those people who are professional relationship managers. Um, they're just in the way. Or we start with strategy. It's like, really? Like – so are you picturing all the other firms who are saying – we tried that, and it, <laughs> oh my God, it was so much work. We just – we don't do that anymore. We, we tried starting with strategy, and it just slowed things down. So we don't do that. But we're – you'll come to the same realization that we did. Like you can't picture people saying that, right? Like the right positioning statement is something that not only other people are not saying, they're claiming the opposite of it. And we have these gutless positioning statements that they're just funny because I'm not trying to be mean and I know people aren't trying to be obtuse in their statements. But but we stop so short of powerful positioning statements and we just parrot what other people are saying so much. This has been great. Thank you, David. Thank you for listening to Two Bobs with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Subscribe and learn more at twobobs.com. That's the number two, B-O-B-S.com. com.